local machine because it's purely method and then whatever we do in other http mechanisms like uh, encoding decoding and what is the protocols all of that is actually abstracted away and the the client and server uh, could be in any language and you can generate code and then uh, like it's it's pretty easy to start a server and pretty easy to build a client because all you have to use is a format called protobuf that will look into so yeah uh, even before going into the details uh, let's look at why we need to use it so basically this we, we have a lot of benchmarks defined outside like there is plenty of blogs which defines the benchmarks uh, grb has very low latency compared to the http and when you talk about scale uh, the la latency matters a lot and when you have a scale of like 100k rpm or like a lot of transaction per second then you really need to think about this as an alternate as well and also even it, it's not just any language like python or go or java but rather even in mobile clients you can generate code uh, from the contract which you define from protobufs and so right now it has support for c++ java uh, objective c for ios python go and a lot of other languages uh, so pretty much it, you're not tied to a particular language uh, just just like http in this case you could say uh so dining like before dining deeper into the code of grpc server and client code you can think of protobufs as the format which you uh, send which is very similar to json but it, it's actually the message formats uh, which is transferred ac across the wire but what it differs a lot here is the way it is structured json is actually meant for uh, users to read like it's actually like you can look at the data so you can read it and then you can make the request via postman but protobuf is a very compressed format and much smaller it's actually like uh, you have key value pairs and then you can imagine keys are ordered by indexes and then it, it just like array with values on a high level but but will we can look at an example so it, it, in this case right like let, let's say your idea like in, in this context and this whole context uh, talk i will talk about a uh, service which you have some idea and then you want to submit to a server and similarly server uh, responds you back with the list of ideas that you can get it like just idea crutch service you can think of it like that so user id is uh, a custom type and title is a string type and description is a, another a string type if you notice all of the fields has indexes associated so what it means is you, you can high level think of it like okay uh it starts with indexing and then you can fetch a value directly from the index so in the client side i don't necessarily need to have the same field names but rather if i have a string in the second a value i can directly access it as like my title and then i can access the third you know third index based uh, field directly mapping to some other uh, field name so the names doesn't matter but rather what matters is the indexes so i mean let's not dive so much deeper but probably what you can think of as like uh, it's all bytes like it's all pure bytes whatever is transferred it's not strings but rather it's purely bytes uh, you, you can look into the details of encoding it's actually takes very less space compared to json uh, probably 50% as the data that you're transferring grows a lot your uh, your saving space becomes much more higher like you will save save more space when you have a higher payloads so yeah um and, and please ping me in chat if you have any questions or uh, if i have to stop at a particular point so that it's it's much better um and given that uh, grpc is almost like defining a methods and then you can send data across as a, a protobuf now what what it gives us more than http is actually streaming uh what it means is like we know http2 has some push mechanism but as far as i've seen like i haven't implemented because the adoption of that is very less compared to the grpc uh with respect to streaming or let's say you have some particular order and you want to know the status of the order just you are making a food order and you want to know whether it is received or not generally how we implement an http based system is uh you keep polling for the orders uh, status periodically like every one second or every few milliseconds 
and if you have like let's say 1 million users um, every second if you make a request it's going to be like 60 million uh, request per minute and it's going to be huge but rather what we would want is whenever order status status changed you would ideally want a push mechanism from server so i have created an order the moment it's picked up or the moment it's delivered uh, i have to have a push mechanism so which means all the clients are passively listening for the order status and the server does the job of pushing the state whenever it's changed so on a high level yeah that that's it so server streaming is actually uh, server streams data to the client client streaming is actually client streams the data to the server which is basically unidirectional like just one way you keep sending data uh, there are some use cases for it bidirectional streaming is the best way like uh, you can imagine like a chat system uh, somebody sending messages producer and then consumer keep reading and then consumer also sends messages so it's both both directional like you can send data and the other part is unary which is actually very similar to method call you make a call and then you receive the response so literally if you want to replace a http uh, actual synchronous request you can think of that as a unary call in grpc so grpc gives you whatever http gives also along with that uh, you have streaming which is much more so yeah so use cases as i said uh, you can get rid of the polling server push it's going to reduce your infrastructure a lot and cost of its infrastructure and much faster the system um yeah before going to watch shot i can show a small piece of code um yeah so so if you have any questions like before diving into the question uh, into the code abstract level uh, please do shoot uh, i can take a minute um hello yeah yeah i have one question like i'm not understanding how how a client can call this function like is it over http or like i'm not able to understand like how how can i like yes. in, i can make a http request but I, i'm i'm not sure how to how do you call a function or okay that i can show you uh, in a bit uh, okay like yeah that's okay if anybody has questions please do shoot if not i can show you one particular implementation and then how a client will make a call to server i i can i'll show that in a bit okay sure no problem cool uh, i'll assume nobody has questions in that case cool so uh let me increase the font size so very similar to what i've shown in the uh, earlier sl uh, slide uh, this is actually a protocol of which you define it's sort of a dsl uh, not a like exact syntax to any languages but rather on a high level uh so protobuf have very different versions like that is not our check we can talk about it later uh this is a go package what we say is hey uh, the code which you're going to generate uh, should have this as a package name and this matters because when we refer the code uh, we refer it based on the package name just like we do right and this is the body just like our http payload if it was a json this was this would be an object and this would be two fields uh, very similar but this has order uh, like some numbered and then it's actually ordered and it's actually another object very similar uh, this is a nested object in this case uh, one careful thing is in http you can change contract uh, but if the client is not consuming generally you do versioning there but here you do versioning in a different bit way because i cannot go and change the title to integer because there would be consumers running but rather i will add a fourth field like you can never change the type of the existing fields and also you can never uh, reorder the fields basically um, i mean that's a high level like but i mean that that's a little deeper like once you use it you will get to know but probably we can talk about it later so this is the message content which we going to use uh, which server and clients going to communicate and repeated is very similar to list uh, so ideas is actually list of ideas that's it and idea response i'm just sending id like user id so the client on a high level uh, yeah so so i hope this makes sense now let's closely look at this particular piece of code this is actually service what we say here is hey this is a rpc call a remote procedure call this is also a remote procedure call and i have defined two methods one is submit idea and which takes a idea like which is a single particular object 
and the other one is get ideas which like you ask list of ideas submitted by user on a high level and if you say hey submit idea if i submit it what is it going to return a uh, id of the idea like i mean in database you can create some id or some unique id and you can return it and get ideas you ask for users it's going to return you list of ideas so this is a contract that you define between server and clients uh, in in http case we just share uh, swagware or some other documentation but you never have a very tight contract right uh, and easily people could break it thinking that hey uh, the field is uh, integer but rather people send float so things could break but here it cannot happen because it's all secret compiled uh, you will know what i mean by that in a second uh, but on a high level this is a service uh, which has two methods submit idea and get ideas and underneath it handles all the you know call over the remote and the proto format everything will be implemented by the generated code so this is the uh, proto buff so now let me go here uh, so the structure of the repository is uh, something like this let's say so i have a command package and then within that i have a client like just for the simplicity sake i have written the client and server in the both same places and then i have a server which has like which which is going to serve the uh, responses and uh, this is the proto buff we have so let's say okay i'm just going to remove this file for now please ignore that so this is the command that i will be running uh, to generate a uh, golang specific uh, proto buff contract so what we saw was actually a, a very simple dsl file but what we have to do is uh, generate a uh, code particular to languages so in this case we are saying it's go output and in other cases you can say java or c++ so let's look at this so if you notice i don't have a pd.go file um, now i'll just run this and then if you notice the difference is i have a different file called ideas.pd.go and this is actually proto buff generated file uh, so let's just open this file and then look at the contents of it so if you notice right like we had a idea uh, proto buff in case of uh, golang it's it's going to be a struct and then this is generated and if you notice here the user is another struct which has id and unit for and if you notice here like it's actually json all that stuff is handled automatically and what you generally do is not directly call the structs but rather it has a method on top of it so what you could say is hey get me the title or get me the description and which is what these fields are so you will have getters and setters as well as the structs so this you can think of uh, okay you define the dsl and then you have a struct with all getters and setters this is this was the first part of it but the second part is what matters a lot uh, which is actually service um let me just put it here ha huh, yeah here it is there is so i hope you can steer if not let me know i'll link these upon site so this is the interface now obviously we are into the golang terms uh, like interface is something which a uh, struct has to other to like you define functions of the struct uh, so that you other to interface and then you can expose it just like uh, i mean in similar to java terms but it differs in a little bit way okay. so what you see here is let, let's open the uh, proto buff in uh, sideways side okay so we had the method submit idea and get ideas it is very similar the best part is like it, it is also accepting context uh, so the idiomatic way and also it is accepting the idea and here it's user so submit idea it was accepting idea and then here it was accepting user uh, here we are not using any streaming if it was streaming the function signature would look very different and you can call functions uh, continuously on it and this is a uh, uh, some custom options which we set for grpc saying uh, hey, what is the timeout what is the retry mechanism what happens in lot of other cases so this is just a functional options uh, just like that uh, you can say uh, like what you that red initials uh, 
I think uh, the options are in a different place. Uh, I'll show you when I show the actual client and server code. So you can pa pass in like, hey, uh, both client and server have to talk in a uh, HTTP secure format TLS with certificate encryption and decryption or insecure calls, just, just normal calls, all this stuff you can pass in the options. And yeah, so, so that's basically it. Like this is the interface and all the, you know, uh, encoding and decoding part is already handled if you notice, because what you will be implementing in your server code is actually something which is adhering to this method, which means you already have the idea of uh, idea struct with you. Similarly, get ideas, you already have the user. So you don't really need to encode and how you need to respond is basically you just return idea struct and then you don't need to write it. You don't need to, you know, uh, bother about uh, composing multiple objects and uh, writing in a particular format which the contract others do. Because literally you cannot break the contract here. Like that, that's the best part I like about it. Um, I guess you, you guys are getting the point. Like be before that I can just show you the uh, server code. Um, probably then I'll stop for a second so that uh, we'll be all be in the same page. Okay. So this is the server code. Um, I, I still have some piece of uh, boilerplate code which uh, starts the server. But if you think of it, this is a service. I'm defining a service. And then I am adding two uh, methods on top of it, which is actually submit idea, which takes a context and idea and returns idea response. And if you notice here, uh, I am depend. I'm actually using this. I'm inside the pa uh, same package ideas because of which, you know, it's simple. But if it was other package, you would have included something like uh, github.com. Uh, slash, you know, slash ideas, and then you will be using ideas dot something, right? Uh, input. So this would be the case in uh, if it was a different package, but since in a, it's the same package, like just for the simplicity, uh, I've kept it like that. So you directly have the idea response and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Let me just close this file uh, so that I can navigate. Yeah. So if you notice here, this is the ref this is what it is referring to in the generated code actually. So it's referring to idea, and here idea response is also referring to that. And if you notice, I'm using some uh, methods on top of the structs, so which means you directly have access to it. So this is a contract I'm uh, adhering to. So I have get ideas, and I also have a submit idea. So if there is no questions, I can. Uh, tell about the context also, but like I hope you get the point that you define a contract of services RPC methods in the protocol, and then a server and clients a, a server have to adhere to it. The client part I haven't shown you yet, so if there is any questions, just ping me in chat. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just ping me in chat if you have any questions. Yes. So. Hey, Dinesh. Uh, Sorry to. Yeah. I just wanted to let you know that uh, we have a recording limit of 40 minutes uh, in this session because it's a free Zoom session. Uh, so it might get interrupted. And at uh, some point later on, Gaurav is going to share one more link in the chat uh, to a subsequent session which we can continue on uh, in case this uh, gets terminated. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, that's fine. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so again, like I'll try to wrap it up. Like I just wanted to give the high level context because Garo also have a, a subsequent talk. So actually go ahead, um, Dinesh, go for details. Um, I might have a shorter talk. <laughs> okay, cool. Sorry. So, okay, uh, I'll stop with like 15 minutes probably then and th th that should work. Okay, so. so everyone, sorry, uh, to everyone who's in, in this meeting right now, uh, please make a copy of the link and save it somewhere uh, because once this meeting is over, maybe you might not even have access to the link. Uh, the link might also be shared on the Slack channel. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so this is on a high level, uh, uh, the server and uh, let's go into the look at the client. Um, but before that, probably I can show the complete part of the server. Uh, because that would make sense, I guess. Uh, server main.go. So, yeah. So if you notice here, obviously you have to register a particular service and also in, in client side, you will be uh, searching for it. 
So here I'm saying, hey, listen to this particular port, like usual stuff, this net listen. But this is what it's going to differ. Just like HTTP uh, server, you will be creating a gRPC server. And if you notice here, I'm accessing the ideas package and it already has a method to, you know, uh, register a particular service to the, as, as the interface. So all you're going to say is, hey, register particular, uh, like the aspect of the server, register my service. And this idea server is actually the interface. So which means anything you're implementing have to other to the interface. And yeah, let's go into the new service. This is the new service which we were talking about. Like this is the service. Uh, I'm creating a new instance of this service and then I'm registering it and uh, the cool idea server. And I'm saying, hey, reflection register. And then that's it. Like the moment you register it, uh, and then you can actually start the server very similar to HTTP. So server.serve on a listen, which is actually the port and address configuration. And then I'm waiting for a stop signal and then stopping, but you can ignore all that. This is the main piece of code where you are creating a gRPC server and then whatever service trucks, which is othering to the two functions, which we define in protobuf, you just register it here and then you start gRPC server very similar to this. That's all. That's all. You have the servers up and running. So I will just, you know, uh, build it and then uh, run it for you guys. Uh, server, RM server, LS, go build, and then server. So now the port is listening. The, the server is actually listening on 9988 port, uh, which we saw here, okay? Um, let me show how the client is, uh, you know, making the call and then we can probably look at the code, like just business logic is very uh, simple in this case. So let me stop the code. Uh, yeah. The client code is very similar. Um, you're going to make a connection. So obviously you have to know that, Hey, which host it's running. So to your question previous, uh, like somebody asked a question, right? Hey, how am I going to make a call? It is, it is still very similar as in you have to know the remote host. But it's just the way of calling is different. Like rather than building a HTTP request, the contract looks very similar to method. But rather you know, you have to know where it is running. It could be a node or it could be a HA proxy, very similar to the HA, uh, HTTP services. But in client side, you will make a method call, that's it. So what you're gonna say is very similar to what we saw as new cool idea server, the way we registered. The generated code also has a, a client, the way of building client. And if you think of it, the contractors will be in common place and both server and the client will be sharing this generated code. Uh, if it is other languages, you will have a separate uh, generated code for that languages and you'll be using that client to make a call. But on a high, on, on very similar nodes, like you will have, you have abstracted the transmission encoding and decoding, right? So I'm creating a user object like we saw, right? Like one was, a uh, posting an idea for a user and the other one was getting ideas for a list of users. So I'm creating a, a user and then leave the context, all that stuff. And here, if you see, I have this two methods on, again, this is the same interface, right? So I'm calling submit idea. Okay. Uh, and then I have the response and error. The error is the interesting part because again, you are passing context and you are also getting error, which is very idiomatic. But what you get in the error is very specific to gRPC code. Like it's not HTTP status code, but rather gRPC codes uh, that we can touch up in later sessions. And if you notice for getting ideas, I again make a method call. That's it. So I'm posting an idea. I'm building uh, for this particular user saying, Hey, my, this is my user. Uh, if people could see, um, Yeah, so this is the idea. I'm creating a new idea. And then for this user, I'm submitting idea, which has a title and description, which we saw in uh, protobuf, like a user and then a title and description, which is what I'm building here. And then I'm sending it to a submit idea, which was the contract, which we defined in the protobuf. And if you notice here, right, uh, this part, we didn't say, Hey, it have to have an error, but rather it's a generated part, very similar to how context is automatically generated. Error is also part of the generated code. So you don't have to explicitly say it. So now you're calling client.getideas and then 
if you notice you have the slice already so you have the slice of ideas and then you just magically do whatever you want to do just like i'm looping through the ideas and then i'm printing it that's it uh in case of uh http uh, you know uh, digitalizing and then uh, you know uh, accessing it it would have been like a you would have required a lot of boiler plate code again so on a high level we create a new uh, client and then we call methods uh, which was defined in interfaces client dot submit idea and then client dot get ideas and then we are just printing ideas and now i can just show you the server code what i'm doing here uh, which is actually uh, in this service so i'm saying uh, like ignore the like i mean this is not going to be the production ready code but rather it's just for uh, uh, showcasing um, and uh, we have a list of ideas and then i'm mapping it with a particular user id so what i'm going to do is getting a particular id of the user from the idea and then i'm going to append this to uh, the map that's all so i have the idea and then i'm putting into the map so basically key is user id and the value is ideas i keep appending it's actually because it's a slice of ideas and when you want to get ideas all you have to do is hey s dot submissions get me the idea of this user id that's it that's all so i mean there's no cases it's just you're appending to users ideas slice and then you're fetching it when it's asked for that's all so we can look at the code i'll just run it and then i'll stop for questions and then like we can dive deeper if there is any other part where i need to explain a bit better so let's run the server this is the server running and uh, let's go to cmd uh client i also have the client uh just one second um sakti apr can you um go put your stuff on mute cool so if you notice all i had to do is like i mean since it's in memory every time i make a call uh the server remembers all the ideas so every time uh, i'm get ha having like three ideas four ideas five ideas so yeah it's four now five now six now so if you notice it is very simple straightforward code but all you got is actually a thread service and the num the, the total number of code that you had to write was very very simple right so if you notice here right like you, you you're just looping through the users and then you're just dumping the data that's all and the servers also i mean that's the awesome beauty of it basically you got the whole struct in hand and imagine even in streaming case you will get the same similar struct so you don't have to worry about hey how am i going to decode it what is going to be the structure of streaming when i'm going to it because you have to think about what is the ending all that part everything is taken care very properly uh, in this uh, case so yeah so we have the service running uh, we have the client uh, we can run it in a multiple uh like i mean just like multiple clients talking to the same server but i think it describes what i wanted to tell uh, on a high level so i hope it made sense like if you have any questions uh, uh you can shoot me now and there is some like using like in order to use it in production ready level there is few gotchas and stuff like that that i can talk about uh yeah uh, that's it like this is just a high level of introduction we can go deep, deeper into grpc in later sessions that's it so i'm just looking for questions cool okay uh there's no questions i'll move on so as we saw grpc uh is binary encoded format of um uh the data so which means you don't need to worry about how you're going to encode and decode but also the part is how you going to debug right like in case of services you would have used postman and then sent json request and received the json responses which is actually not possible in this case so though it like it, it has a nice side of other part of it but in 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 general developer sense you would have to write a simple uh, client to call it and then see what is the response you can't make requests uh, there are proxies to convert http request to uh, a gs grp is a request the where the where it helps is not for debugging but rather you can write grp service tomorrow and then replace the existing http service in your production system 
and the clients wouldn't notice the difference, but server, you can slowly change stuff and then you can adopt the clients as well. And um, yeah, th that's actually what's called bridge. There are multiple bridges and Envoy is a very nice proxy. It's by Istio, I guess. And it, it, it also serves as a load balancer. So in case of HTTP request, you guys would have seen uh, Hedge proxy. Uh, in this case, we can use Envoy, which understands the gRPC protocol. And the server push is actually like interesting, but what you have to keep in mind is uh, anytime you have a streaming, you have an active connection going on. So which means if you have a thousand clients, the server will have to handle thousand clients, which is actually thousand connections, which maps to file descriptors. Uh, without proxy, it's going to be a big deal. Like before going into that, like, uh, I mean, this is all some things you have to consider. So if you are using a proxy, it uses something called multiplexing. Uh, with five connections, it can serve 100 clients, stuff like that. Uh, again, this is all, I wanted to keep it high level because I'll, I'll not dive into the deeper details. Uh, we can go and talk about it later. Uh, so yeah. It gives us advantage, like uh, whatever you get in HTTP, you get it, but rather it's much more faster, higher latency. Uh, you don't need to do versioning multiple URLs, but rather you keep adding fields. Uh, and then server always understands it, and the clients always uses the new fields if it's wanted. The old fields, if you don't use it, you still keep it. Like You can't deprecate it because there could be out of thousand, there could be one client using this field. So that's all like something which we can talk about later. Um, not breaking the contract is something which you need to watch out for also. Um, load balancing is another interesting thing that uh, you guys should check out if you're thinking of putting it in production. Uh, this is all again deeper conversation which we can have in a uh, later point of time. But if you have any questions with respect to server or client code, uh, I can take it now. If not, I'll close it for now. Yeah. So questions? Wow, crickets. Um, okay, so one question regarding um, so gRPC does not work over HTTP, right? It's a completely own uh, protocol on top of TCP. Uh, no, it's actually on top of HTTP2. Uh, on top of HTTP2? It's, it's on top of HTTP. It uses HTTP, but it's just that uh, it uses a better payload, encoding and decoding. And it just abstracts away the uh, whole encoding and decoding boilerplate load. So uh, if you're talking in terms of protocols, it's still the same. It's just that much more developer friendly. That's it. And it has streaming capabilities like because it's have to be HTTP2, right? Uh, which is very simpler to implement compared to HTTP2. Like at least if I looked at a HTTP2 code, it's not easy to implement because there would be a lot of gotchas. But here, this is very simple, uh, and you can just write streaming in a very simple function. That's it. But yeah, the protocol is still the same. Uh, I hope I'm right. Like, if not, I'll verify again and let you. Yeah, I think that might not be the case. But uh, because given that um, HTTP is a text-based protocol, right? You still have um, um, so I think protobuf is a binary uh, format. Mm -hmm. That would oh. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I think, uh, so, so it uses HTTP2. I mean, what we are confusing about is uh, HTTP is literally like you can again send binary data, right? Like if you want to optimize your HTTP services payload, right? Let, let's say you have to send a file. What will you do? We're going to send binary format. Or if the number of users is 100, what you can think of is encode everything, base 64 encode it and send it as a string. Uh, even with HTTP services, what we have used in our uh, production systems is uh, in order to send Kafka data, what we do is we input the data in protobuf, but still make HTTP calls. So HTTP is the transfer mechanism, but rather, uh, so, sorry, HTTP is the protocol which, with which uh, it operates on TCP, but rather the transfer mechanism could be XML or, uh, you know, JSON. You could also replace it with protobuf, like encode it as protobuf and still make HTTP calls. But this just abstracts everything away. That's it. So it is actually using HTTP. Got it. Got it. Cool. Yeah. Any other questions with respect to like, I mean, the, the point is not the code. Like I have the code, uh, you guys can check it out later, but on a very high level, uh, how it compares with the HTTP and how it's simpler 
to just start a service and how, how simple it is to make a call. I hope you get that. Um, if you have any questions, just shoot me on that. Uh, okay, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, you said about uh, we cannot remove fields once we have made a contract. So can you go more in detail into that? Sure. Okay. So if you think of it, right, the moment uh, I have user ID, uh, you have 1000 clients, like it, the clients could be mobile, but also the clients could be different organizations, different teams, right? Initially, what you have said in V1 is, hey, uh, idea, I have user ID title. And what in V2, what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to say uh, title, description, and then I'm going to remove the user ID, right? So then what is going to happen is, let's say we are adding time stuff, right? The reason why you can't remove the field does, just think from intuitive perspective, right? How it's going to encode is, it's going to say, hey, zero is uh, the user ID in binary format, okay? And then one index is, uh, binary format of title, which is actually string, right? This is what happens in the server side, which means client assumes in format one, uh, you need to have a, a binary format of title and it's going to be string. And imagine if you're changing fields, now it will become three becomes timestamp, right? So in this case, three becomes timestamp, but the client wouldn't upgrade to V2 version. They can still be in V1 version of the contract. So which means, they would expect a user here and then string here and string, but rather you would be passing a timestamp, uh, which is going to break the contract. Right? So okay. even in the existing HTTP APIs, right? Let, let's say you, you mentioned uh, a particular JSON, you will not remove the contract. It's okay to add fields because it, it's okay to add fields because the client is in a client doesn't know about the field and it's, it, it will be work fine. I think in JSON case, uh, also it is the same, uh, but we don't tend to do it. Uh, generally, you add a versioning of V3 or V4, right? So in this case, it, it, it's just that like you have to maintain the order of indexes. And then on a high level, you can say hey, zeroth index is uh, custom type, and first index is string, and second index is uh, string. Which is actually what's going to happen underneath. Like, uh, it, it just indexes based on indexes. It's going to send the encoded format of the data. You really do not need key and values because the key is actually known in the client side also because it shares the contract. So the whole point of uh, JSON with long key names, it's gone. And basically 50% of, uh, of space you're saving it in that case. So on a high level, you get the point, right? Like you are transferring data across a uh, slice and each, uh, index is a struct, let's say interface, and each and everything has the same type across client and service. So you can add field, but you cannot change the existing type. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, this this question actually raises one other question. So you mentioned you um, use Kafka, right, in, internally. So you'd yeah. have messages from different versions going into the Kafka queue, and probably some sometime later the services would be. Um, um, like um, using different um, versions, um, like they will be reading different version data. So how do you manage that? The, the only way is um, you maintain the, uh, the order, right? So uh, they're not going to consume different versions. So let, let's say the same thing, right? Uh, we have user ID title and description. We have four, let, let's say three clients. Three clients is in the same V1, right? Uh, works perfectly fine. L let's not break the contract, uh, but rather I want to add a timestamp field, which is going to be in uh, fourth index. Now all the clients, which is still in the view in contract, wouldn't know the timestamp, but if somebody wants to use the timestamp, then they have to upgrade. I mean, generate this uh, code from V2 contract. So the, the, the clients can exist in different versions. So which means somebody can be in older versions. The point is they wouldn't get the newer fields and somebody, if they want to access the new fields, they have to upgrade the clients by generating the code again from the protocol. And the whole crux is you're not, break, you shouldn't break the contract. If not, the encoding and de the decoding and clients will be a chaos. Like it'll break it. So did that answer the question? Yes. Yes, it did. Yes. 
the um, there's one question from Sakti. He actually he or she, I'm not sure. Um, they ping ping me into um, ping me on um, yeah. chat privately. Um, I've I've wrote the I'm question so as versus GRPC. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what they mean. Sakti, could you? Um, I, I, I can explain, but I don't have the 100% of answer. Uh, so even without GRPC, right, uh, WebSocket is a way of uh, establishing a socket connection. It's actually a live connection. HTTP, we always have a, like, a, make a call and this response is done, you uh, get the response. WebSocket is, was a means of doing the same thing which I was saying, which is actually streaming. You have a socket connection and then you can write to it and also read from it. I haven't used it in production, like in code wise, but what I know from high level is, uh, you basically have HTTP uh, calls, but the moment you have a clients which can support uh, HTTP two, you s just set a header called uh, upgrade protocol. I, I think it's some upgrade, some, some format, and then it can upgrade to WebSocket. So what this means is in, in case of HTTP two, uh, in case of a rendering a web page, right, you would make, get an index.html, you will get style.css, and then you will get uh, some other JavaScript file. But rather, you can push everything from the server. And that is sort of internally optimized. But in case of business case, I don't know how it's going to work. We still have to write the code. Uh, like, I think both gRPC and WebSocket is, lies in the same protocol wise, it's going to be the same. But the WebSocket, I think the format is still similar data. It's not compressed. And uh, there is no generation of code, right? Like, like we saw in gRPC. So there's no part of protobuf playing in uh, WebSocket. So WebSocket uh, header upgrade. Yeah, it's basically upgrade on your HTTP. Once Correct. you send, uh, so it sends uh, and it has its own protocol there to send and it's uh, if you see it has rfc standard uh, you need to send a upgrade header also means there yes. is a udid code you have to send and then you can establish a bidirectional communication over it yes uh, on a high level i've used it like that, that's what it means uh, like the client can upgrade to it so that it becomes faster but i haven't tried with streaming at all like probably I, i'm also interested in the same topic i'll explore probably we'll do it as a separate talk yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, any other questions? If there's no questions, like Gaurav, you can take over and then give the talk. Um, it's almost nine thirty. Um, I'm just wondering. I could um touch upon what I wanted to do, but I'll probably go in deep in the next um talk. Cool. Like just in the interest of time. Um, awesome. Uh, yeah, you can take over. That's all I had. Uh, I will share the links and all. Like we can probably talk and chat. Karo, to you. Uh, you'd have to. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, all right. Um, so let me just go back. Uh, bring up my editor. So, how many of uh, of you are aware of beautiful Sue in Python? Um, yeah. Sorry, I can't uh, see the hands or anything. Um, you'd have to actually speak up. Um, I'm assuming um, most of you are familiar with um, Python's beautiful soup library. Um, yes. Uh, you, we have something similar for um, in Go called um, soup. So this is by Anas Khan. Um, he has um, he has written a nice little library um, which brings a lot of the features from beautiful soup into Go. So I've been um, using this for uh, toy hey. programs and, hi, yeah. Hey, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, hey, can you increase your font size a bit or reduce the resolution? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, this must be better. Is it better? Yeah, it is, thanks. Awesome. So one thing about so uh, beautiful soup and soup are um, 
HTML parser libraries, parser and scraping libraries. Um, they help in, um, so, so, so given the example, so you have, um, you have a web page it basically pulls it and you can actually, um, navigate through the XPath to, to work on the, um, on the data underlying HTML, uh, HTML structure. Um, you can manipulate, you can't manipulate DOM, but you can um, access the data which is embedded in the DOM. So that's, that's the goal of uh, beautiful soup and soup library. So the soup library is um, kind of underdeveloped right now. Um, it has a few um, bugs, a few edge cases, which has been, um, which needs to be fixed. Um, and I was hoping to do that as a live um, coding today. I'll probably do this next week. Um, I'll probably go um, deeper into this next week, but I'll just, for the sake of, um, so this is the Python code, right? Um, let me just open up the Python code. So this is the HTML document, document which we have. And um, we are trying to get the text of one particular element inside this. Um, DOM structure. When we are trying to get the text, it should show up as to a JSP page. I'm not sure if you guys are able to see my screen. Um, if you're able to, um, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Miss Miss Bilder, yeah, go on. It's this one. This element. So I'm trying to get access to this element um, to get the text out of it. So beautiful soup in Python handles this perfectly. Uh, when you do a print of uh, soup dot find ul and the first li element of it and get the text, it gets the text of the um, nested a tag as well. Whereas um, what you have with the soup library. It kind of fails actually. Um, so it's not really able to. Um, so you'd see that um, the soup text. So I've written a test case for that. Um, doing the same thing, finding the first jewel and getting the first li, and then figuring out if that uh, text matches. If it does not, I'm just printing out the text. Um, just marking this um, test as a failed case using the error function and printing out the actual text that we got. You can see that it gives to a, that's it. It stops at um, thing. So um, I want you to, so this was the gist of it. Um, probably we can take this up the next time uh, we connect the next um, go study group. I'm not sure if um, there'll be people who are interested in it. I just wanted to know the feedback first. If we could uh, solve this issue together as a group in the next meetup. Absolutely. Uh, it looks good. <laughs> Go ahead. Awesome. 